Why, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to the GSL English podcast. My name is, of course, Gideon. And in this week's episode, we are joined by one of my best mates, Morgan. So listen along as we just have a nice and natural chat together. We talk about how we met, food, and Morgan is from America. So we talk about some of the differences between American and British English. Also, we have a, a chat about visiting London for the first time. So it was an absolute pleasure to have Morgan join me this week on the podcast. So sit back, relax and listen along as two mates have a chat together. So Morgan, thank you so much for joining me today, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, doing well, doing well. How about you, man? I'm very good. I have to admit, it's, um, it's a real pleasure to have you on here as a guest, but also as a good mate, as a good mate of mine, because you're actually my, my first non-British guest joining. I'm excited for that. Yeah. I mean, I say that I have only had two other guests. I'm making that sound like we've had many different. But it's got a good, it's got a good sound to it. We'll just that... act like I'm the 30th, 40th guest. And I just happen to be the first one that yeah. came along that wasn't British. Yeah. I always try to make it sound more official than it actually is. You have to, because at some point you will have 40 guests and then it's just going to yeah. be an easy pass into that. So we'll just, exactly. we'll, we'll, that's the mentality. Well, I live by the mentality of fake it till you make it. I, that's, I make a living off of it. My apartment <laughs> is paid off of that saying. Of just faking it, just faking yeah. it through life. Consistently. Yeah. I teach people how to do it. I think I want to have a class of teaching people how to fake things because I'll watch people do things. I'm like, <laughs> did you just admit you couldn't do that? No, fake yeah. it. Like yeah. just fake. Don't let anybody know what you can and can't do. Just always have them guessing. I think there's a market for that. Definitely. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me. I do appreciate it. And it's nice to just have a chat with a mate because before this, we were just talking and I think we can both agree over the last year, we've, we've been pre pretty rubbish friends. We've not, we've not spoken enough to each other. And I was thinking, when did we first meet? When was it that we first met? Ever? Ever? Oh, man, I think it's when you were... Uh... Yeah, because we knew Heather first, right? So we knew we knew your wife first. So we heard we knew a lot about you before <laughs> we ever actually met. Yeah. But then we met, and it was like, oh, okay, cool. I don't remember. It would have been. Let's see, y'all got married in in February. Was it two thousand and eight? No, two thousand and nineteen. I think it was when we first. The met. year before pandemic. It was. Or was it the year of pandemic? So yeah, no, it was yeah year of pandemic. So. As many of yeah, kind yeah, of the can... listeners will know, I lived in Dominican for a, for a little while, but that was actually where we met, wasn't it? We met yeah. in the Dominican Republic and then this beautiful friendship ensued. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, what, what do you expect? It was always going to happen. It was, it, was, it was a very natural progression, I think, our friendship. It worked well. It worked well because we loved Heather there, but, you know, it was like, mm, how's this going to be? But then it worked. It was like, okay, we approve. I we approve. That. Exactly. So you're, you're currently still living in Dominican Republic. Yep. Yeah. I've been here in June. It will be nine years since wow. I've lived here. Wow. I have to admit seeing the sun behind you, um, for those that are perhaps listening to the podcast, uh, I have two views right now. I'm staring at my window, which is a gloomy gray, rainy sky, but I'm also staring at a palm tree at a man in shorts, um, which makes me yeah, yeah. jealous. Indeed in shorts. Yeah, pants of the devil here. Very good. Now, I want to start off with something because as friends, there's something that we really bonded over, and that was food. I think what, what better friendship starts than beginnings with, with food? Food really is your life, isn't it? You love food. It, it, I wish Sometimes I wish it wasn't. I was actually <laughs> just talking to a friend of mine this morning about food. Uh, he was asking if I did the laundry in my house and we were kind of talking about the different jobs that my wife does and, and I do and kind of how it naturally came to be. And uh, I brought up cooking and cooking is one of those things that I, I, it's always, I've always enjoyed cooking. My, you know, I'd learned from my dad. I learned from my mom. I learned from my grandma, but it's a natural kind of progression because I'm always hungry. <laughs> if you're always hungry, you're always needing to 
think about food. So mm -hmm. I'm, I told him, I was like, if I eat breakfast, I'm literally thinking of lunch immediately. Like I finish my plate and I'm like, okay, now what's next? What's next? And it'll be hours between, but I'm like, no, nah, it's time to plan it now. So it's just always food. Always. And the rest of the day revolves around those three meals. Yeah. Right up until like yeah. bed, I'm going like, I know I shouldn't fit one in. I should have worked out today, but, but go on then. it wouldn't on then. be like a bad thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. You have a real relationship with food. So do I, I mean, I'm the same. I love food, but one thing that I used to love about you is when we used to, because actually Morgan and I used to so live in the same apartment building. So, and I lived, uh, on top of it. and if we were driving somewhere, particularly in the morning, Morgan would often very kindly bring me a breakfast burrito. Yes, now, sir. I, I wasn't a burrito guy before this, but I loved it. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think anyone who does cook could relate to this. Food in general brings people together, but when you are already someone who loves to cook, a natural kind of I don't know symptom or whatever you want to call from that is wanting to share what you're making because you're making it's an art, right? Cooking is an art, so any art that you have when you really have a passion for it, you now want to share it, and that's what cooking is. So. I'm always trying to find people who haven't tried things that, you know, I know how to cook. I don't know how to cook a lot, but I love to cook. So the things I do love to cook, as soon as I find someone who wants it, I'm like, okay, I've got a list of 15 things I want you to try. And we're just going to go down that list. Yeah. Uh, and, and burritos is one of those. It's such an easy, like Tex-Mex type of, I'm not going to say in any way it's authentic Mexican. It's very American Tex-Mex for days, yeah. but a good breakfast burrito, that's it. Can you just explain what you mean by Tex-Mex? Because we have a few Tex-Mex restaurants in England and I never actually realized until you told me, until I met you, what it actually stands for. What is that? What is Tex-Mex cuisine? I, I don't really know where it originated, but right. I mean, by definition, Tex goes for Texas and oh. Mex goes for Mexican or Mexico. I don't really know which one it is, but essentially it's the fusion food that Mexican is currently known as in the States. Because oh, if you go close to the border, Arizona, Texas, Southern California, like San Diego, LA, you can get authentic Mexican food. Right. But as soon as you leave the border, and even in those areas, they will have Mexican restaurants. It, it's a staple in America. Mm. Um, every town, no matter how small, you know, my grandparents are from a town of 10,000 people. I think there's four Mexican restaurants in the one town. And oh, wow. <laughs> they're all similar foods and they're Tex-Mex. Now people in those areas won't call them Tex-Mex. They'll call them Mexican because for them, it's their only relation to Mexican food. And you figure, well, it, it's people from Mexico cooking it. It's people from Mexico serving it. So this must be what you eat. And it's as wow. far from the truth as you can get. It's actually very different. Um, so, you know, basic thing is Tex-Mex is going to have flour tortillas. Authentic Mexican is going to have corn. That's oh, a right. huge thing. Is that a thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, a, okay. a taco served on a flour tortilla is in no way authentic Mexican. A taco okay. served with tomatoes on it, unless it's a fish taco. A taco served with cheese, sour cream, taco sauce. All of that is Tex-Mex, which in itself is a very good food. It's just not in any way authentic. Uh. So I grew up eating tacos every week, you know, and I grew up very American. You know, my dad's from Kentucky. It's kind of where I grew up. And that was something we ate every week, you know, tacos, you eat tacos or burritos or something. And it's similar to Chinese food, Italian food. The same thing has kind of happened with those yeah. foods. We have our Italian food. We think it's authentic, but it's far from the fact. Same thing with Chinese. We think it's authentic, far from the fact. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. kind of the background I think on Tex-Mex. Huh. It's our own fusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that's what kind of, that's how I understood it as well. Exactly. And that, that idea of fusion is kind of the blending of different cuisines and, and foods together. But whatever it was, whatever it was you were making me, you smashed it every time. You, it was brilliant. And I, I remember there was quite a few times where, because I would be driving and, and eating this little burrito in the morning, and I'd see you looking at me, <laughs> watching me eat it. Yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah. And there was that element of pride, thinking I'm providing. I'm providing yeah. this man. Yep. The food that he needs. Yep. And there's a real Absolutely. satisfaction in that, wasn't there? 
anyone who appreciates food, it's like, yeah. oh, man, you got to, especially when you're hungry. I think surprise food is just about the best food you can oh, get. Yeah. Like when you're hungry and you're like, oh, I guess I'll get a bag of chips or crisps. And then it's like, oh, you know what? I just got surprised with yes. whatever. You oh, know, it's incredible. like that the whole day is better yeah. right off the bat. And there were so many times we would go out and one thing I'm really guilty of is never having breakfast. Um, and then I, I would kid myself that I didn't need it. And then I would need it. And I, but I didn't know how much I would need it until you would provide me with this silver wrapped little slice of heaven. And it was just, it instantly made that day perfect. So I think that was one, that was one of the things that I really appreciated. Um, and probably, of course, I'm back in London now. No one's provided me burritos. That's a problem. It, it, it actually is. And so I yeah. guess you're, you're irreplaceable. Um, but, yeah. you know, what are you going to do? I'll what take it. I'll do? take that to heart. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah, exactly. it. That's a fun for you. No, no, thank you. So, of course, um, you're an English teacher. So, mm -hmm. of course, I know what you do. I'm making it sound like it's the first time we met. But... You're, you're an English teacher. How, how long have you been, been teaching English for? Yeah, probably since about, it would have been beginning of 2016. Right. I believe it was. So, no, 2017. So I think we're at eight years. Wow. Um, okay. I think 17, six, seven, seven years. Seven years, I think, Time is flies, about how long. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's secularly as well. Cause I think, um, before that I, I was doing it kind of as favors, but oh, okay. actually working, you know, at that as my main job. Yeah. yeah probably about seven years now. Cause you speak Spanish as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I tried learning Spanish a little bit, not great at it at all. As you very well know, <laughs> as you have experience, you get by, you get by, but that's your, um, your Spanish is incredible. It's, well, I didn't prepare you for this question, but how did you, if, how did you do that for you? What was the main kind of aspect of learning Spanish? Of course you teach English, but learning Spanish to the level that you are now, what, what helped you to do that? Um, I think a few different things. It was, uh, the first language I'd taken up other than my native language, which of course we don't really learn. We just acquire. Oh. And it, yeah, it kind of just started as a progression. Um, we went through, I went through Rosetta stone, you know, I was a kid at this point, I was 16 when I started learning it. So my dad bought Rosetta stone, which at the point was booming, you know, their commercials were all over TV. It was massive. And what is and, that Rosetta stone just in case? Yeah. Rosetta know. stone. So it's, um, it's still a, a very known language learning program. I think at the time it came on CD ROMs that you would, you know, put yes. in your computer and download. Yes. Now I believe they have, you know, like an online subscription and live classes attached, but it was marketed as a language learning software that a lot of uh, fortune 500 companies or even military would purchase to teach people that they were sending to other countries or military members who were going to be serving, you know, maybe, based uh i think that's where they use based destin i forgot the yeah, word. Based, uh, but based, based yeah yeah based out based outside of the u.s so that's kind of what it was marketed towards so that obviously when you use that as your advertisement a lot of people i think got into it the only issue i think we found is that it really was made for people who were going to be immediately traveling so, oh, okay. and I, I heard this complaint recently from someone as well who had bought it at the time. It was like six, 700 bucks. We're talking 10 years ago, 11 years ago, six, 700 bucks. It was an expensive piece of software, but it forced you to go in levels. You could never go past. And if there was something you didn't want to learn or didn't already knew or felt like you didn't need at that point, you couldn't pass it up. And so they went right into transportation, yeah. traveling, ordering at restaurants. And when you're living or from a country where the native language is not your target language, you don't need to know how to catch a bus. It's yeah. kind of the last thing on your mind. It, this is useless information. I don't need to know what a bus driver is in Spanish. I don't need. So that was kind of something we ran into me and my dad were both doing it. And it's like, I don't need to know this stuff. I want to learn how to have a conversation. Exactly. So yeah, we did Rosetta Stone and I also tried Pimsler. And Pimsler was one that I really liked. Pimsler 
is another one that's now a subscription service or you can buy it at that time it was cds we actually got it from the library wow. before my dad uh bought it that was also a five six hundred dollar thing of software and wow. it is it's based off of four units 30 lessons per unit and they're 30 minute pure audio lessons there's no writing there's no reading they are meant to be listened to repeated and they build off of each other and they tell you every lesson, you know, don't double this. Uh, so don't do two in a day. You're allowed to repeat today's, but never jump ahead. Oh. So they want you to just learn today's. And then the next day you get, you, you do the next lesson. And I think that was about the most useful thing for me. And I think the main thing was that it provided what a teacher provided. Because a teacher guides you. That's what a lot of people are lacking, I think, in language learning. And I didn't have a guide. We were self-learning or yeah, self-learning, self-taught. So Pimsler builds on itself. So you right. start out, it's really nice. It starts with a conversation and you don't understand any of it. Hmm. And then it goes, listen to it again. So then you listen to it a second time. And then he goes, by the end of this lesson, you will understand this conversation. Wow. And it, it kind of piques your interest and you go, okay. So you're, you're in it for this 30 minutes and he'll slowly break down words, how you pronounce them, what they mean, the use of them. And then at the end, he goes, listen to this conversation again. Oh, wow. And you understand it. Yeah. And it was by far the most useful thing for wow. me. I think it really got me started in the language. I still recommend it to people who don't want a teacher yeah. or even as, as, cause you don't really learn English with a teacher, I think, per se. You, it, they serve as tutors a lot. If you only do three 30-minute classes a week, you're not going to learn the language. You have to study outside of that class. Mm -hmm. and I think Pimsler is a good addition to having a teacher as well because it's building up kind of your vocabulary and different words. So yeah. it's not just what you're doing in the class. And that helped a ton. And then it was just moving here. I was learning for about three years and then moved here and I've lived in the country for eight years. And that was kind of a crash course because just that complete immersion within yeah. the language. Yeah. And I, and I was really, um, I think it worked well because I already spoke it because I've always growing up in the States, you know, we, you, most people don't ever learn a language. My excuse, which I've heard multiple times as well. I hardly speak English. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it, I swear, it's the most famous cop out I've ever heard. Well, I, ugh, I hardly speak English. I mess up English. And it's purely a cop out, right? You're just absolving yourself from any responsibility of ever maybe wanting to learn a language or kind of get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And I used to say it. So then when I moved here, I was so happy that I had spoken some because they always used to say, those same people would say, well, if I lived in Mexico, I'd learn. Or if I lived in, and it was always this idea that immersion meant learning. And I have found living here, immersion does not equal learning. Because you can put someone, an adult, in an area where no one speaks their language and put them there for 10 years. And unless there's actual effort put yeah. forth to learn, immersion does not equal learning. We're it's, not made. It's got to be a combination of everything, isn't it? Because, yeah, yeah. I, 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 was, I was guilty of that, you know, living kind of i did have this idea that oh once i'm in dominican republic after a year i'll speak spanish but actually no it's not it's not a given it's not a guarantee mm -hmm. that you're just going to immersion is essential i think it is essential it is a great part of um your kind of your journey in learning a language along with everything else it yeah kind of it takes everything else and i find immersion puts it into place so you, yeah. you you spend the time learning the vocabulary, the grammar, the whatever, but then immersion helps you to connect all the pieces together. Um, and it's interesting. Yeah. I was thinking for you, you kind of you actually started learning Spanish before it was at the point where learning a language is ac as accessible as it is now. You know, because now you can you can go on social media, you can it's so easy to have classes over zoom or online. You can, you know, there's teachers on YouTube. Mm -hmm. When you started, it was not that accessible. Was it? It was kind of, you were that pre language uh, accessibility. No, I think there was only a couple YouTubers people would talk about. And again, it, it wasn't, 
it was missing what you kind of need and that's building on itself. Yeah. So it really wasn't in a common thing. Uh, I mean, it's not that far back. 10 years ago, plenty of people were learning. You had Google Translate, which was still a lifesaver. But this idea now that you've got this talk into it, you know, Google Translate then didn't have a voice option, you know, it, it, at least that I remember. Now, translating apps and these live translations and even the way Google Translate has changed, it used to be really kind of uh, recommended never to use it because it would just throw you off. It would give you just terrible translations, words no one uses, yeah. bad conjugations. And now it it's really consistent in comparison to what it was. It's still not yeah. the best Perfect, thing to use but yeah. Yeah, ever, but it's still a lot better. It's de- language in general I think has come a long way and classes have gotten better oh, yeah. a lot better as well. But the, the teaching and I think the way really anything is taught has evolved so much over the last I'd say more so since COVID because mm-hmm. during that time, everyone thought, well, I'll take this time to learn. Um, yeah. So the new methods of learning really, really evolved and adapted. And I would say probably one of the most interesting things about you is you're, you're not only an English teacher. Um, I'm going to get you to tell me what else you teach in case I pronounce it incorrectly, which is my natural inclination to do. So what else do you teach? So I also teach ukulele, which is the correct way to pronounce. Yes, because ukulele. I'll be honest, my brain wants to say ukulele in that really yeah. awful kind of tone, ukulele, but it's yeah. not. It's ukulele, and it's not. You know, honestly, it's not a, it's not a huge thing mm. uh, because the whole world understands it. But it is a cool kind of. I mean, I don't know. This isn't really the topic of the podcast, but. Uh, real yeah. quick, you know, ukulele go is it. go with it. It's an yeah. instrument from Hawaii, right? It's a cultural instrument from Hawaii. A lot of people view it as kind of like that instrument you start when you're 12, or that you get in school, or that the teenage girls always played growing up. But in Hawaii, it's not at all viewed that way. You know, they it, they teach it in schools, but it's a serious instrument. It's a cultural instrument. Um, the last reigning queen of Hawaii before the U.S. overthrew the kingdom of Hawaii had actually composed over a hundred songs on the ukulele. So historically it's a massive instrument and the name itself is Hawaiian. It's, it's two different words uh, that are still used in Hawaiian today. Uku. So U-K-U, Uku, and then L-E-L-E, Lele, which sounds similar to almost Spanish pronunciation. So it's Uku Lele and Uku means flea or a small bug similar. So if someone says, oh, you have uku, oh, it's yeah. like, oh, you have head lice. So that's not a good thing. If someone's like, oh, I think you have uku, it's head lice, still used today in Hawaiian. And then lele means jumping. So moko lele, if I'm not incorrect, moko is um, island. So right. moko, island, lele, jumping, island jumper is airplane oh. in Hawaii. So moko lele. So once you kind of know the background of it, I think it makes it more enjoyable to say it the way it's supposed to be said. Ukulele, jumping flea, which came from how quick their fingers would move on the fretboard. That's kind oh, of the history. Really? Their fingers that- so quick. Wow. Yeah, that's where it comes from. Jumping flea. So ukulele, flea, jumping. It comes from how fast the fingers would move. And uh, that's why I, I always tell my students, it's every class I start this out because I think. Right. Yeah. It, it's it, people don't really view it as a real instrument it's kind of like oh that thing you start out with but you know as i teach it it's like no we're gonna we're gonna view this as your main instrument we're gonna really get into this and we're it's got a deep history outside of what i think people in the states or europe or different places kind of view it as it's like no this is an instrument exactly yeah. and there's one th- yeah i would completely agree with agree with you and it's an instrument that deserves respect Simply because I know, um, of course, you've got your Instagram page. You're um, at Jamaican Me Mellow. Incredible name, yeah. at Jamaican Thank Me you. Mellow. And I've noticed through kind of watching your videos, watching other kind of ukulele players, there's a passion that seems to come with it. There's a passion that comes with playing the instrument, which I feel is quite unique. I, I don't know whether I'm right there, but there's... You know, it's such a small thing, but it packs so much passion, so much emotion when it's being played. I've noticed that from going through different videos and things. Yeah, I think it's such a happy instrument. Yeah. You know, I always say uh, 
because I, I wasn't really musical growing up. I didn't grow up dancing. I didn't grow up playing any instruments. Uh, I always laugh because my dad used to say, when we were listening to a song, you know, you're singing in the car. My dad would say, oh, who sings this song? They would be like, oh, it's so-and-so. And he'd be like, why don't you let them sing it? And it was this on <laughs> running Brutal. joke. Brutal. Oh, it was just wow. savage. But just grew up with it because yeah. it was, it, we just didn't really grow up musical. And so when I tried picking up guitar at 13, I lasted about six months and just gave it up. I literally did not touch a guitar for 10 years. Like wow. touch one because it just seemed like this daunting task. And I think most can agree when you're starting out on an instrument, it's really easy to make it sound bad. Yes. And what I love about ukulele is it's kind of the opposite. It's really hard to make it sound bad. Mm. You know, it, it, it's so easy. You pick it up, you strum it, it already sounds great. And it's kind of just going up from there, which makes it a really attainable instrument for people who yeah. already have a background in music or are starting out and, and kind of view the ones who are like, oh yeah, I always used to want to learn that when I was a kid. It's like pick up ukulele. It, it's such a, it's affordable. You can get an okay one for $60. Yeah. So it's not expensive and it's easy on the fingers. It, it doesn't give you the calluses guitar will give you because it's got nylon strings. It's portable and it's so easy to make a beautiful melody on it. That is really something you have to work towards if you are picking up guitar or any of the other stringed instruments. And it seems there's, there's quite a community that comes along with it as well, isn't there? There's, there's this kind of real, I don't know what, I don't know. I'm almost envious. I'm not within that kind of realm, but there's a real yeah, yeah. community that comes along with the love of this beautiful little instrument. It really is. And it's, you see a lot of people um, really across the world. It's m huge in Brazil, really big in Japan, which of course, Japan and Hawaii has always had uh, historically a really close relationship there. Um, but it's big all over the world. And I think it's kind of a band of people who have that similar mindset where maybe you tried an instrument and it just seems so hard or the way your teacher taught it, they, they kind of taught it with the background of classical music, which is taking music and taking the art out of it and just making it um, something you study. Yes. And they, they just, for whatever reason, picked up ukulele and then started playing it, heard that amazing sound, maybe got out their social media with their community. And it's it's huge in um, senior homes. It's really, really big with people over the age 50, 60. Um, during pandemic, it was really oh. big. Um, there's a, a nonprofit, I forgot what it's called. Uh, I can't remember the name, but it is essentially, it's a nonprofit that gifts and raises money to give ukuleles to kids that are terminally ill or in the hospital with some, you know, serious disease. And a lot of music therapists will use it um, in, in, you really? know, providing their therapy. So it's kind of gotten into a lot of different areas. I think that other instruments, for whatever reason, have never really tapped. You know, you, you've got people in senior homes taking ukulele classes, yeah. giving seminars and stuff. And you've got kids that are sick in, in the hospital and, and it's such an easy instrument to gift. You can play it in a hospital bed. So I think it's ended up in a lot of different places. And the people who see that kind of always come together in one way or another through social media or at festivals that they do all over the world. It's such, um, it's such an accessible thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like, but that being, it's not just, um, I think I, I've perhaps been guilty of feeling this in the past. That, oh, it's a step to guitar, but actually, no, it's a, it's an instrument. Yeah. It's, and, it, and it deserves that respect. So it's quite interesting. You know, you, you've gone from English teacher to ukulele teacher. How's my pronunciation there? That felt good. Was it good? My pronunciation. That's perfect. Ukulele. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That felt okay. So you've gone from ukulele teacher to no English teacher to ukulele teacher. Kind of just quickly, would you say there's any, I don't know, any aspects of teaching that translates across subjects? So, of course, you've got two very different things here, but would you say there's any uh, principles or aspects that you, you think, yeah, that translates across teaching any subject? I think absolutely. And it didn't really come to, because I started teaching in pandemic. It was a hobby. Um, I made an Instagram and then some friends asked for lessons and right. ultimately now it, I've had to make an adjustment because I, in a week I'll have 18 ukulele students and six English now, which was a huge change for me 
because I always say I'm an English teacher and now I'm really an ukulele teacher that also teaches English whereas by trade I'm an English teacher but I'm three years in I think now teaching ukulele and um, with that I think the experience kind of grows I take lessons myself you know I'm I have a teacher as well who's um, oh, Rick okay. based out of I've been playing ukulele for 50 years he's a professional so I think with that I've been taking lessons for about a year and a half my teaching has grown and I've found that music in itself is a language, mm. right? So it, music, it has rules, but those rules can be broken, but there's also fundamental rules. But when it comes to teaching it, people will learn what they want to learn. Mm. And I think that's a big piece of English teaching, Spanish teaching, or whatever language as well as music. So the approach that a lot of music teachers will take will pull out a book. You know, most people who took music in school, they started by studying a book and you're studying a language and it is a language, but we all get into music because we want to make the sounds. Yeah. And I always ask my students, you know, can a blind person play an instrument? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have numerous famous musicians. Can a deaf person do it? And, you know, I always say like, oh yeah, kind of. And, and it is possible, right? You can feel the beat. Um, many deaf there are many deaf musicians, but most of them had to play music before or play something yeah. where they have to feel the the beat through the ground. Mm. So I always bring that up teaching, you know, our ears are the most important part. So when I approach music and when I approach language teaching, it's what does the student need right now? What oh, are you good. into? You know, what's your goals? Where, where do you want to go? Kind of like the Rosetta, thing, Rosetta Stone thing. Are you planning on traveling? Then let's attack that. We're at the airport, you're going through immigration, you're at the hotel, you're checking in, you're meeting with the CEO, you're meeting with this person. Let's let's go for that because these are things you're going to use immediately. And that's kind of the same with music. What are you into? I would say, what music do you like? Oh, you like Taylor Swift, you like Ed Sheeran, you like, what do you like? And then I'll kind of demo a few different things. Do you like this sound? Do you like this sound? And kind of just take notes and keep that as a main kind of goal because motivation I always say is the most important thing with learning anything the moment discouragement enters you, you start losing motivation and then you find oh I haven't practiced English all week yeah. or I haven't practiced I my practiced as a group. teacher yeah. it's it's keeping that motivation going and that, that's kind of actually yep as you said earlier which is a really interesting point that teaching actually I said this on the, on the podcast last week as well but teaching isn't just about teaching You've got to find ways to keep your students motivated, to keep them, to keep that passion, to keep that fire alive for learning. Um, yeah. And that is part of our role as teachers, mm -hmm. whatever that is. It's not just presenting information. No, make it engaging, adapting to the students. So for you, that that is what kind of translates across the subjects. Yeah, I think massively, it's just this idea that, you're going to learn what you want to learn. And it's it, it's yeah, an art yeah. and language, I think, is harder than music. Most people love music. You do it because you want to do it. Language, a lot of people do it because they have to do it. There's that. So there's an extra difficulty attached to language learning that music doesn't have. But all in all, it, it's figuring out what the student wants. And then as a teacher, keeping the motivation alive while also giving them what they need that they don't know they need, that if you only do, they'll lose their motivation because it's not, the things we need aren't normally enjoyable. So it's, it's okay, we're working towards this main goal, but I'm also feeding you things that when you get there, you're not only going to have this main goal that you've reached, you'll have this umbrella or kind of like a canopy yeah. of knowledge to where now you realize, oh, I also know how to do this. Or I can also play this, or I can also understand this person talking about this subject that I've never talked about kind of because you've given them the tools to work with what they know rather than just get them to their target and go, okay, what's your next goal? Yeah. So it's kind of that combination, I think on both sides. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. I really appreciate your insights and I think, yeah, you're only going to learn what you want to learn. Um, and I think as a teacher, you, you, you've got to make, got to make it enjoyable, haven't you? You've got to keep that, that fire alive. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and of course, you know, as you said, you're you're doing private lessons more so now with ukulele than than English, which is a, yeah. 
which is amazing. So if you are interested in in learning ukulele, please, um, I'll put Morgan's, I'll put your Instagram in the, the description below. Um, so yeah. And then give him a Yeah, follow. by all means, pick it up. Even if you don't have me as a teacher, I always say like, I don't care if you take lessons, just buy an ukulele. Or if you want to play another instrument, just start playing music. I think it, it just brings so much happiness that we don't always have in our busy lives full of oh, work yeah. and responsibilities. Pick up an instrument. You know, even you take lessons by all means for ukulele, let it be ukulele, but whatever, just yeah. start playing some music. Exactly. No, I'm, well, you know, me, I'm music. Yeah. I, I love music. So You're yeah, that guy. it's got to be part of your life. Now, I'm trying to think of an interesting segue into what I wanted to talk to you about next, but I can't. So we're just going to take a hard turn now. <laughs> we're going to take a right hand turn down to a particular kind of thing that we got to share together. There's an experience that I was quite honored to share with you. And that was visiting London, visiting England, uh, which kind of all the time that we've known each other was something that we perhaps spoke about, you know, oh, visiting England. I always said, oh, I'd love you to come with us. I'd love to visit together, which we got, we got to do in what year was oh, I'm terrible with years. Is that 20? Uh, it would have been two years ago now. What year is it for? I think 2022. Yeah. So it's the summer of 2022. Um, and I'm really interested, of course, as an American from what part of America is it? I've kind of lived all over, but I always claim Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know too much about Kentucky, but I know that it's perhaps very different <laughs> to England. Um, very different. So I'm really intrigued to know as, as an American visiting not just England, but Kent, the southeast of England where you came with me, what were your thoughts? Was there anything you was particularly expecting? Was there anything that, that stood out to you? I know that's a pretty big question, but yeah. How, how did you find the experience of visiting England or London for the first time? I think we loved it. Um, me and my wife, you know, of course we both went, um, absolutely loved the trip. I think there was some nerves, going right. into it only because living in a foreign country we have seen kind of the ugly side of people who don't travel a lot who then travel and th there's an ignorance there it it's nothing negative towards right. them because i had it as well you know at one point i thought the only people in the world who spoke spanish were mexicans so it, it it's not in any way negative it's just not coming from a background where you travel a lot and being in a tourist destination, we've seen a lot of people travel and we've seen why certain stereotypes and reputations have been earned. So us going to Europe, I think we were nervous to mm. kind of continue the stereotype yeah. or, or have people look at us like, oh, you know, here's an ignorant American or, you know, they're, they're going to laugh at us or make Joe. And I think we were nervous in some ways on that. But all in all, the, I think we spent about a week and a half total. It was fantastic. Everyone we met were just the sweetest people. The culture was really nice. Of course, we were friends with you for years. Um, and it was great to get to see where everyone was from. You know, what, why certain things get said and, and learn about the history as well from your dad, learning a lot about the history with England because I was really interested in kind of how yeah. certain things have kind of came to be. and it was so nice getting to see like, oh, we have all these friends from England. We're always watching, like I was watching, what was it BBC 999? I watched, and we watched so many English yeah. TV series that it was like, we're finally here. Yeah. And it was so fun. So fun all in all. Oh, it was a great trip. It was a great trip. And I, I remember kind of, because I think when, when you first get into London, a lot of the stereotypes kind of, or what a lot of the cliche or, um, a lot of the quintessential things people imagine about London are actually immediately there. You know, you've got yeah. the, the, the telephone, the red telephone boxes, you've got the black cabs, you, you've you got um, Big Ben, um, the, the London Eye, all of these things are actually kind of, as soon as you generally arrive in the center of London, it, it's boom. And it's kind yeah. of, I always, for the people that we've, we've been fortunate enough to have a few guests now visit us in London. And, and I love showing them around the city but it is kind of like all of these quintessential things that i think a lot of 
that ones think about London are immediately thrown in your face. Yeah. And I remember seeing your faces, you know, and it was a really cool experience for me to see you experience London. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that experience. It was really fun, I think, to because London, it you loved London and you talked up London so much and you were right. It, there's just, you know, you've got everything's close. You yes. know, I think that was the thing. We yeah. we walked to a lot of these things. If anyone's ever been to New York City, you know, you can walk, but you can put in, you know, 15 miles in a day and not touch some of the places you want to go to. But London, it did seem like most of the like checklist yes, sites that's the, that you want to see. Yeah you can see you can like the big Ben and the and the telephone booths and all these different places and um yeah all these different places could just get walked to and it was really cool to kind of get to experience the city and, and get to see where they uh what was it where they filmed was it thor that kind of oh, that Greenwich long Park. walkway Greenwich. yeah that was gorgeous it's good and things that you don't even realize like oh this is and kind of freaking yeah. out like oh this is where that one Cause if you've been to New York, like they always use the same areas in New York when they're in movies. It's like, Oh, you've been there. Like, Oh yeah. You kind of see it all the time, but being in London and being like, Oh, that one movie or that one place to that one. And remembering different times that you've seen it in a show or, or a movie or, or anything. It was really cool to see. It, yeah. And I, I know I might be biased, but I do maintain it's a great city to visit. It's um, and as you said, the, the history of it and just hearing kind of, the stories about London and some of them being fables and tales and you kind of, you sometimes you can get caught up in the mystery of the city as well, but it was, it was brilliant. Now going back, of course, to something we spoke about at the beginning of the podcast, you're a foodie, you're a food guy. Now oh. there was one thing, there was one brand, one <laughs> chain of food. I'm not going to call it a restaurant not a food supplier that Morgan, not only, I wouldn't say you fell in love with it, but I would say for your, your period while you were here, it, it was borderline obsession, wasn't it? Would you like to share with bit. us what it I don't have a, and what you loved about it? I don't have a car, but I wanted a bumper sticker. I remember <laughs> wanting a bumper sticker of Greg's, Greg's because it was, it was just this, it was like an epic subway, but in no way like subway. I, it just got me that you guys would put sausage and bacon together and it blew my mind because in the states you get a sandwich and you've got a bacon sandwich you know bacon egg and cheese yep. or you've got sausage but then you go to england and they're like chuck both on it and good. why not why not have both on it yeah it was fantastic i loved it that and nando's oh nando's the portuguese restaurant yeah nando's Ooh. was honestly and this was i, I want to say this because i love food and when you're from the States, there is a stereotype towards English food. And I want to go ahead and talk yeah. about this stereotype. I appreciate this because this stereotype, I think is, is, is quite a broad stereotype about English food. Now, I, I think I know what you're going to say. And I go, yeah, after you. I know that I'm sure there's some bland English food. I know maybe historically for different reasons, there were lack of certain access to whatever, but the same could be said about most places in the world. Um, English food, I've always been told was bland. Mm -hmm. It's just, and it's never even been an arguing point. It's just, yeah. oh yeah, well, at least it's not English food. I was genuinely impressed with the food I had in England. Every pub I went to, and of course, most of what I had was, was pub food. So I don't, you know, I, I can't talk for the food necessarily always cooked at home, but Nando's was great. Greg's was great. But going to pubs, which is the typical hangout spot, it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible. Fish and chips, fantastic. Um, meat pies. It's like an epic pot pie, but just steak. Mm -hmm. Don't mask it with veggies. Just shove some meat in a pie crust, cover it in gravy, and put it next to mashed potatoes. Why not? It was consistently good. And I think me and my wife both love food. We just always looked at each other like, this is supposed to be bland and bad. You know, like this isn't supposed to be good, but it was fantastic consistently. Yeah. And we went, because it wasn't just with you and Kent in London. We went down to Cornwall. Of course you did. Yeah, we, of course. We, yeah, we went down to Cornwall. We stayed outside of Brighton. I can't remember the little village that we stayed in there. Um, 
but you know, we, we went most of most Southern England. It was not like we went really North of London, London, but consistently the food was great. You know, the Cornish pasty in Cornwall was oh, fantastic. A Cornish uh, pasty in Cornwall is an experience that everybody it, should. It, and it, oh my God. Have, have you ever brought it up? Have you talked about I, a Cornish? Pasty? I have actually, Joe, I haven't touched too much on Cornish pasties, but I am a, I am a, a Cornish pasty fan. I love them. I'm going to be honest with you. I've got some in the fridge right now. Um, the, yeah. Just the, can I, it's going to take 30 seconds. Can I talk about the background of a Cornish pasty? I would love you to. So, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I'm really into food. So I don't think I forgot too much. The idea that people would be working in a field, right? Because we, I'm from Kentucky. We've got a lot of farmers, right? So you do a big breakfast, 5 a.m. You've got bacon, eggs, potatoes. And, and if you've got cows or you have uh, pigs, you, you know, it's fresh bacon, it's fresh pork, it's fresh chocolate milk. It's really fresh stuff. Big breakfasts, big lunches, big meals, big dinners, lunch, not too big, but this idea of a Cornish pasty that you'd be working in a field, you'd come in, you'd be wet, you'd be cold, you'd be tired. And they'd go, oh, I want to give you a plate of food in a handheld fashion. You can take with you. And that's what it is, you know, because a Cornish pasty, it's got, you know, all the apple pies and all the things that are made out of, of uh, I guess it's dough. You know, you've got that crust, that roll, that that little crinking that they do at the end. But Cornish pasty is so big, you don't really eat it. It's so thick because it's a handle. Yeah. So your dirty hands can grab this, almost looks like an empanada if you have any Latin background. And it's got steak, it's got potatoes, it's got gravy, and Amazing. it's got a pie crust. It blew my mind because it was cold and rainy when we went. Yeah. And I'm gripping this giant, looks like a, or a calzone as well. Looks like a giant calzone, yeah. but that doesn't bend. And it was everything. I remember just kind of sitting back every bite and being like, mm. no, they've got it figured out. Yeah. It's like they've genuinely yeah. got it figured out. It's For me as well, Cornish pasty is all about texture. It's not just, of yeah. course, you've got the, the, the beef, the potatoes, which has got to be seasoned, but. You've got the crunch of the, the the pastry or the dough, whatever it is. Yeah, that's what it is. Pastry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it is just perfect. And you kind of set the scene perfectly there. That what the way one should experience a Cornish pasty is if you've ever visited Cornwall, which you probably did. There's there's some beautiful seaside towns, isn't there? Absolutely stunning. And I know for my wife and I, we visit somewhere called St Ives which I think you might have visited. I can't quite remember, but there remember. on a kind of, you can kind of set the scene where it's the sun's kind of going down. It's getting a little bit dark. The lights are on in the cobbled streets. You've got the shops. It's a little bit cold. Kind of the, the windows of the restaurants are steaming up. That must've then... been where we had it. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's what, that's exactly what it's like. And then you, you just stand in there having a hot Cornish pasty. There's something magical about it. It's it, a, it's an experience. It's great. Yeah. It really was like eating a steak dinner that was portable. Yeah. You know, that same great feeling of, you know, there with your family and, and it's evening and it's gotten dark and you're going to town on this meal that someone just slaved over, yet you've taken that whole meal and put it inside of pastry with a handle. A handle. It's superb. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. it. I appreciate you bringing that to the attention of uh of our listeners and it, it it's true it is true pub food is is not that bad it's actually if anything it's a great experience now yeah i would really love to talk to you for longer mate i, I think we're gonna have to do like a part two of this episode because i just i don't know how long i don't know how long we've been talking now but i've got so mm -hmm. much more i want to talk to you about so i think we're definitely going to do a part two of this and I, i'm pretty sure it will just go back to food it will go back Probably. to food but one it's thing kind of I, I want to just kind of, which I think the listeners and viewers will kill me if I don't go through some of these. Now, of course, when you, you came to England or being mates with me, you'll notice we, of course, we got very different pronunciation of certain words. And one, one expression that I noticed that I used when I first kind of met you and spent time around Americans that didn't really translate was all right. All right. Now, yeah. For me, when I say "all right," I don't I don't want or expect a response. If I say "Are you all right? How are you?" 
then yeah, okay. But if I say, you're all right, I don't want a response. I don't want anything. I just want to, yeah, all right, okay, keep going about our day. That took you by surprise, didn't it, that expression? Definitely. I think it takes most people by surprise. It does. It really state. does. Because it it's really only a question you would ask if you feel like someone isn't okay. Ah. And I think that's the big difference. Like if I say, are you all right? I'm not going anywhere. We're now having a conversation. Oh, so you're I've actually seen, seeing like on an emotional level, what's up? Yeah. Like this is the intro to me seeing how you are doing, but it's not a general, we only ask it when we've seen something. Like I would say, are you all right? After you get into, you know, I find out you got into a car accident. Are you all right? Or I found out something happened. You, you know, and and it's not always that serious, but it's only going to be asked when you've seen something concerning. So it's not like a, Hey, you all right. I noticed that it almost be rude. If I was to do that, because it'd be like, hey, I'm concerned about you. Bye. It would, yeah. Why'd you ask? Because like, I noticed when we, when I, when I first kind of moved over and was spending time together, there was an introduced to a few of your friends. I'd introduce, oh, you're right. And they would go, yeah, why? What's that? Mm-hmm. I'd be like, well, sorry, I'll just, you know, are you okay? And it, they would take them by surprise. Like, oh, sorry, do I look yeah. sad? Do I look, but it's just, um, just a culture. I mean, that is to me what makes any language amazing is just the nuances and the the different kind of um, different ways we use the language. Yeah, absolutely. So just to finish off, what I want to do is just do a little bit of pronunciation, okay? I'm yep. going to say a word the way I would pronounce it, and then I want you to say how you would pronounce it afterwards. Now, disclaimer, yeah. neither is right or wrong, but it is strange. <laughs> okay. Yeah. First one we're going to go with. Vitamin. <laughs> vitamin. Okay, so you put the emphasis. So I would say vitamin. Vitamin. And we're going vitamin. So I'm changing the T to a D. Vitamin. Yeah. Yeah. Which and the often, stress is on that first syllable. That's kind of one of the biggest differences, isn't it? Is yeah. That sound. Okay. Mm-hmm. Herb. Herb. H is silent. H is silent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If someone said herb, we'd be like, you just say herb. I actually herb. say herb sometimes joking about it. I'll be like, oh, do you have the herbs? And it's like a herbs. joke because ah, it's silent yeah. H. Yeah. No, so that, the H is just gone. Uh, yep. It doesn't exist. Okay. Now, this is kind of a, I say schedule. Mm-hmm. What would you say? Schedule. Schedule. But that, oh, I know a few people here that would say schedule. But yeah, schedule, schedule. I'm trying to think of some more. Some uh, more. I can think of like spelling differences and, and like yeah. different words. Um, corridor is one, corridor. right? Yeah. Like what is corridor to you? A hallway. Hallway. Yeah. So we'd only say hallway. A corridor is, we would know the word, but if you said corridor, it almost comes out in like corridor. Like we almost do it oh, in an okay. accent because it's so old English slash British English for us. What if I said wardrobe? Uh, wardrobe we would never say it my grandmother might um but <laughs> we would we would say closet closet yeah yeah of course wardrobe closet. place where you keep your clothes closet and the, the biggest yeah. things uh, crisps crisps yeah so we call it chips just do crisps exist um crisps is not a word that we'd use in the states crispy so we'll t- change it into an adjective at our y crispy oh, okay. A crisp is is not something that, yeah, we don't have. Because, of course, you, and this surprised me, right? So we call them chips, but then chips for you is fries. Yes. Not French fries, but fries. Yeah. And this is what I think also needs to be touched on. You guys do say fries because I think a stereotype is that, oh, Americans say French fries. Yeah. British English, they say chips, but that's not necessarily right because chips for you we would call steak fries because steak fries are the like wider potato oh, that are yeah. so like the fish they're chip, wider chips. Cut. The chips. Yeah. Yeah. So what you call um, chips, we would call steak fries, but you guys do say French fries, right? Yeah. For the I'm skinny really ones. not the connoisseur of this, but for me, French fries are like the thin chips. Like McDonald's. But. Oh, see, my wife says French fries. I mean, I know that you guys would call those chips yeah. as well. But, but my wife says French fries. But I know yeah. I generally, 
I don't know whether I'm just a purist, ignorant, or unwilling to change. <laughs> we'll always call them chips. Yeah, um, I love it. But yeah, French fries here now. If you go to a restaurant, French fry, you'll just kind of expect skinny chips. Which we what? would call shoestring fries. We actually have a name for that. Shoestring skinny fries, fries, really? Yeah. If you go into a frozen food section, you can get frozen steak fries or you can get shoestring French fries, which are the skinny I didn't know French that. fries. Yeah. Huh. You learn something new. Morgan, no. it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. I really appreciate you taking the time to, um, to join me today on this little podcast that I do. It's been a real oh, it's been great. Thanks so much for having me. It was uh, really an awesome conversation. Yeah. Oh, we've got a lot more to talk about, so maybe maybe we'll do a part two whenever you're free. I'd love it. And have a have a good chat. But um, but yeah, guys, if you um, if you are interested in the ukulele at all, whether just learning or or even like private lessons or anything, please give Morgan a follow at Jamaican the Mellow. As I said, you can see it in the caption below. Brilliant teacher. Um. But also one thing that I really appreciate is your enthusiasm, your passion for it. And I often find when I see your videos or your reels, if I'm, you know what it's like on social media, I sometimes have weeks where I just, I find it difficult. I don't want to do it. Often when I come yeah. across your, your passion, your, your zeal for it is contagious. So whether you're into the ukulele or not, please give them a follow. You, you'll benefit either way. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. You're more than welcome, mate. We'll catch up soon. Thank you.